when, when we first got there, of course, and, and this happens in, in every war to every, per, every pilot or any, every combat flyer, uh, when you see those bullets for the first time coming up at you, man, I tell you what, it, it could have been 30 or 40 degrees out. Uh, we, we, we were sweating like pigs, you know. Uh, it was unbelievable uh, how you, you, when you, when you see them the first time, it just, everything gets going in your body, I guess. But after a while, we got, you might say, complacent, uh, because then we, we knew about the tails and we knew about the, 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 this and that and the other. We could see the bullets. The bullets seemed to slow down. I can remember, man, the first time they came out. Well, I couldn't tell you what side of the airplane they passed us on. But, but as, as we got more and more exposure uh, to this, uh, we... Yeah, you we, build up an uh, yeah, we immunity knew it, to it. Right, and, and so we would know whether to to try to break left or whether to break right underneath it, you know, which way the, the trajectory of the bullet tree. So uh, these these kind of things, uh, of course, were all to your benefit as, as you got on, but they were also to your detriment because you would often not react to them as you should have, as you would have on your first few missions. And we would oftentimes stay down in that place uh, uh, too long. And because of those engines out there, and uh, we didn't have a whole lot of armor plate, uh, those engines were the best armor plate we had because we brought home a lot of a lot of bullets in the th cooling fins of those cylinders out there, and so we took a lot of hits that never that could have been vulnerable, but weren't because those engines sitting out there. And then, of course, the crew chiefs would show us, "We're going to go look for a hole on the left side of the airplane. And there's holes on the right side, you know." Or they would show us uh, the, uh, the the bullets in the fins of those cooling uh, blade fan, uh, fins on 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 each of the cylinders. And, uh, but in particular, one night uh, up in the north, we caught, John and I were new then, and bullets at that time were still going fast, and, then, and they were scary. <laughs> <laughs> they were always and scary. They were always scary. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and we got up in the, up in the north uh, uh, where we were flying at, at that night, and uh, you go ahead and, and tell how we found the target. It was Blue Boy, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, we had a uh, road watch team up in uh, uh, northern Laos in an area called Barrel Roll. And of course this place was dominated by the North Vietnamese regulars. <clears throat> and, uh, and we had a key Lima site up there where our tank can was that the fighter aircraft used to make their strikes, B-52s to make their strikes on Hanoi. So that was a crucial point up in uh, uh, the plane of jars and the so there was always a heavy presence of a North Vietnamese army up there and one of the headquarters uh, for these people was a place called Sam Nui and I can't remember the guy the general's name that was in uh, the North Vietnamese Pathet Lao, the Pathet Lao uh, General uh, but that was his headquarters and we located about well, where he was, and we thought he was in this cave area. And we decided we were going to hit this target with uh, uh, no flares in the dark. And I'll let you go. From, you know more about that than I All right. Well, John got me headed in the right direction. And essentially, all we did was uh, we went around down the valley where we thought. And, of course, we didn't use any flares, and it was in the dark, but we did have moonlight. So we did have some, yeah. we could discern some of the terrain and hopefully not fly into it, <laughs> which we didn't know, obviously. But, uh, so, we, I, I think we had a thousand pounder in... A thousand pounder, yeah. A thousand pounder in the Bombay again this night. And uh, we just uh, flew down and we didn't know how, what kind of, uh, we were, this was a very dangerous place to go because of the general's headquarters and the, the Pathet Lao, uh, you know, concentration there. Uh, so we were expecting a, a lot of anti-aircraft, uh, and evidently they didn't have their radar on or something that night. And we snuck in and went right downtown Sam Nui, so to speak, uh, in the middle of the mountain. And we punched off that thousand pounder and poured the coal, pushed it to the full, you know, mill, and 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 moved on out of there, and never turned back, never, <laughs> and kept on going. We don't know what kind of a what happened. What we hit, we might have just made a big hole in the road uh, or in the in the side of the mountain that uh, 
Uh, but one of the things we that couldn't was, go back uh, and look for fear of getting shot down. One of the things that was striking to me at the time, I don't know if you recall that or not, but when we were at altitude up in Barrel Roll in that particular location, you could look over to the east and you could see the uh, the lights of uh, of uh, High Pond or Hanoi. Uh, half, I guess it was High Pond. I think it was High Pond Harbor, yeah. and we yeah. could almost see the ships in the harbor. So that's right? how close, close we were to, to the North Vietnamese border. But one night we went up there, also up there, and, and uh, uh, we had a road watch team uh, of Laotian, again, the same, uh, and he was, his call sign was Blue Boy. Blue Boy. Yeah. And Blue Boy it was a road watch team. They're, they're sitting on the side of a mountain, and, and uh, they're, they're radio, they're transmitting uh, uh, on the radio to us uh, mm. that they caught, they have some trucks. And so John and I... I was telling the wrong story. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so John, yeah. So John... Yeah, this was, uh, this was on another night from, from the story. From I just the Sam Newey story. Yeah, yeah, from the Sam Newey story. But uh, yeah, uh, the blue boy was on the side of the, the mountain. He was looking down at the road and he could see the North Vietnamese. I guess, I don't know what was North Vietnamese or Pathot Leo, but they were in the trucks going down the road. Whoever they were, they were bad guys. And uh, so what we were going to try to do was, again, to interdict the road. And then, I don't know what the uh, angle on that hill was, but it was, uh, you know, real steep, more than probably 45 degrees. And so it was difficult to put an interdiction, a thousand pound bomb in the middle of the road at that angle with a narrow road and then a steep slope on the other side of the road. And uh, so George tried to put it in the road, uh, but the bomb hit above the road on the side of the hill above the trucks <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the lead truck he uh, being so startled because we were striking uh, basically in the dark and he didn't probably didn't realize what danger he was in and that thousand pound bomb went off above him on the side of the hill and he drove off on the side of the road and, and rolled down the hill <laughs> And there were there were troops in the back of the truck. I don't know. Yeah, we don't know how many. But uh, so then I pulled up and, and did another run where I dropped a flare, and we came back and discovered what nineteen there were nineteen trucks in that convoy, yeah. and they had like three guns uh, on uh, in the truck in the convoy, and as I recall, we we got up and we came back and we silenced the guns on our first one or two runs, whatever. And, and the convoy, we got the convoy stopped. Of course, they stopped, I think, at the 1,000-pounder. And then uh, we stopped the uh, guns from shooting at us. And uh, there was like what, there was one in the, near the center of the, of the convoy and one on the back of the convoy. Anyway, we got them stopped. And then it was uh, just a matter of, at that time, destroying all those trucks. And we, I think we got 19, we didn't destroy, we ran out of ordnance before we could destroy them all. Yeah. But uh, we stopped 19 trucks that night, and another airplane was coming up to uh, uh, relieve us and, and finished off the uh, the convoy. Which, that was another thing. That, that I, was one of the first convoys uh, that we got, and also uh, that our group as a whole caught so many. Because normally, we, uh, six trucks was was a lot in a, in a convoy. Yeah. 19 trucks was just unbelievable, and and our and so. Our adrenaline was just going like this uh, all the time because you know you, with 19 trucks and you're just sitting there and they're blowing up and, and one at a time. And in fact, a couple of times uh, we get them sideways, whatever. In any way, it was it was just. And then John was saying again, he's keeping track of things. Fuel. I mean, we got to go home. We got two and a half hours to go home, and I'm, I I don't want to keep going, you know. And he said, No, no, we got to go home. We got to go home. Saying. And I said, okay, John, one more pass. And it was, I was like a druggie, man. I was, the adrenaline was up here, and I still had bullets, and there were still trucks that hadn't blown up yet. <laughs> and he's beating the hell out of me to get, get me off yeah. the target to come home. I was really, you might, I, I, to put it lightly, I was more than concerned. Because <laughs> we, we had the we previous, uh, the TDY group that were there before yeah. us, uh, uh, the Big Eagle group that came from Herbert TDY, they lost a crew because they ran out of fuel on, on final right at NKP. And because they, I guess you call it target fixation. You just want to keep striking that target one pass after another and you lose track of how much fuel it's going to take to get you back safely home. And uh, it can be a major pucker factor uh, running out of fuel. <laughs> 
And but one of the new, really, and now that we got to talking about that particular incident, uh, one of the really unique things about our mission was that on so many of these missions, we did have the benefit of having a road watch team on the ground. And uh, uh, these were, uh, I guess, most of them ties, as far as I know. Or Laos. Or Laotians. And they could give you real first hand information as to how effective or ineffective you were. Uh, and these these guys were putting everything they had on the line to be out there, and some of them uh, did end up getting caught. But they provided a real service to us to, to, to in striking a target. That was a great equalizer for us since we didn't have a sophisticated equipment, but we had eyes on the ground sometimes that could. That could have, that, and those those guys, uh, you know, in our uh, in our wisdom here in the, in our military, we we didn't have the. Uh, we didn't provide them with radios that were compatible with the radios in our aircraft, and uh, we were very lucky in this particular case that, uh, what did they come in on? It wasn't HF, but it no, was VHF. VHF. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of them had FM radios, and we couldn't even receive, so we didn't even have that, well, we did for a while, or, yeah. uh, and all finally, or we finally got them. But anyway, we were very lucky to, to have those guys, and even though you couldn't understand them, they could get you to the target. Although I, we did understand them, but it was very difficult with their accent and their their being excited themselves plus they couldn't be too loud because they didn't want anybody to hear them if they, you know if, if they were uh, there so anyway it was uh, it was a fun mission up there in, in many respects uh, speaking of radios uh, i heard stories that some guys called their wives at home from the airplane using the true story hf yeah on hf uh, the did either any of you ever I, call anybody backstage side using it? I didn't, but some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the people in our organization that had previous SAC time, if they had come directly to us from a SAC organization, then they knew the HF frequency for the SAC command post from wherever they were stationed, uh, and uh, they could get on our HF radio and and uh, call back home. And then they would get a phone patch in from the command post to the home phone. I can, just, I can just hear this in my head. Hi, honey, this is George. Yeah, I'm at 4,000 feet, about to go yeah. kill a bunch of North Vietnamese. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to call you and say hi. I'm doing yeah. really good. Uh, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> everything's fine. <laughs> just a minute, I'm going yeah. to roll in. I'll call you back. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they, they had that capability if, uh, if you knew the right frequency. Uh, well, let could. me t talk about radio frequencies and, and John and, and a lot of the navigators. <laughs> I don't know who came up with this, but thank goodness for them that whoever that was or they are, uh, John, and uh, a lot of times we did, of course, like we told you, you know, the B-26, we didn't even have an ejection seat. We were lucky to have what we had in that airplane, and we didn't have any way to be, uh, you know, the uh, things that would allow us to know that we were being painted by the radar, you know, and uh, so we didn't know if we were radar-controlled guns were sweeping us or what. And so that's why all the time when we were flying, we were always jinking and turning and changing altitude and, and everything. Because if you flew straight and level, you were going to, something's going to get you. And so anyway, uh, John would, you talk about the radio, you, I believe it was ADF, wasn't it? And he would go through the frequencies, hoping to pick up a, a, the frequency that the radar was yeah, on. Yeah. And yeah. to find out if we, because that was a two and a half drive, up our drive up there to North Vietnam. And there were missiles all over the place, you know. Just we were just on this side of the border, uh, all yeah, the way you up. Could, uh, being an EWO, I guess I knew this that, that the frequency that uh, you could get on the ADF uh, was a multiple of the primary frequency of some of the Chinese search radars. And when you got up into barrel roll, and the, some of their search radars reached over into northern Laos. And once in a while, when you can get a, when you were being painted by their radar, you could pick it up on the, on the ADF. Uh, not a very sophisticated thing. But uh, it was our only early warning, our radar yeah. warning, and and then the final, uh, or a, not at final, but a, 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 a story that was kind of, well, it's not really kind of funny. Uh, was uh, when the B fifty two strike went into. Uh, one of the choke points called Foxtrot is one of the uh, ones that uh, was on the southern end of the Ho Chi Minh Trail just before it got to the DMZ. And uh, they put a B-52 strike in on that to suppress the guns. And, and we think they did a good job 
But we're, so we're flying that night, and 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 when a B fifty two strike comes up, we would get up about four or five miles off the trail and 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 hide over somewhere because those B fifty twos, their radar wasn't the best, or their navigators weren't the best. But anyway, oftentimes if mm. they're going to strike here, they might be within a mile either side of that target. Well, see the so, the B fifty twos then. Their bombing technique, I'm not, I never was a crew member or a nav on the B-52, but they use an off, They have to have an offset point for their nav radar to bomb with. And when you're over the jungle, uh, there's nothing much definitive to offset on, so they were limited on the accuracy of... of uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a function of the uh, capability of navigators as much as it was a function of the uh, yeah. uh, equipment. They just didn't have that type of radar where they could pinpoint uh, where the target was. And so they could be three, four miles off, you know. And, uh, so in any event, uh, after they went through, they called us and said, hey, we've got a C-130 with flares. How about you come, uh, you know, uh, team it up with him and give us a bomb damage assessment of what that B-52 arc light strike did. And we knew Foxtrot was heavily defended. We had one of our airplanes shot down there uh, earlier, uh, just be after we got there, or just prior to us getting there. In any event, uh, and he went through there, and then the C-130 was in front of us, and he was supposed to be dropping his flares that would light just about at our same altitude, so we could determine how, what he did, or damage he did, how the road was torn up, and or if there was any guns, which uh, it was heavily defended on either side, and, and a three or four hundred foot cliff on, on, on the left side, and a, and a river. Uh, so they wanted us to give a BDA, and so the C-130, he was smoking when he went through there and punching flares out, but they were lighting up above us, <laughs> yeah. as I remember. And so we're going as fast as I can get that thing going, too. Because I didn't want to be, but we're and we're kind of flying, go, going through the thing, and the light flares are lighting up, and they must have done a good job because we didn't get hit or shot at at one at any. But uh, our our biggest time is instead of looking down to see where the bombs went, we were looking around to see yeah. where guns were going to be coming from. But uh, they they were put a lot more craters in the in the ground, uh, uh, holes in the road. But we got uh, back from that mission, and uh, uh, there was a sack representative from uh, 7th Air Force at our debriefing, full colonel as I recall, and he wanted us to give a BDA, bomb damage assessment of the B-52 strike, and we told him just what George said, well not many of the bombs hit the target. And he got irate, you know, he says, well, he said, well how do you, uh, what type of equipment you got on your aircraft? And we told well we don't, he says uh, something like, what kind of radar do you, we don't have any radar, or what kind of bomb equipment you, well we don't have any. And he says, well, how do you expect a BDA, a, a B-52 strikes, who's got all this capability? And we just basically said, well, with our eyeballs, none of them hit the target. <laughs> <laughs> the, ro the road was clean. The road was still there.